So without any further delay, it's my great pleasure to uh, announce our keynote um, speaker. Dave is the author of Passion Works, Your Guide to Passion in Modern Workplace, and a highly regarded Canadian motivational speaker represented by the National Speakers Bureau. He's well known as a frequent contributor to the Canadian nonprofit sector. He's been a keynote speaker and trainer for the Canadian Association for Young Children, United Way <coughs> Ottawa's Sharing Our Strengths Conference, Speakers Bureau and Loan Representative Programs. Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Community Legal Clinics of Ontario, LASI World Skills, Mothercraft, and many other nonprofit agencies staff have raved about the long-lasting positive impact his motivation sessions have had in their particular agencies. I'm confident that they will also leave us with a long-lasting positive impact. So, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I drove down from Ottawa today, which is where I'm from. Um, I need to clear something up right away, which is that I'm not that Dave Jones. <laughs> <laughs> when I grew up as a kid uh, in Ottawa, I'd come home from school, I'd go down into my parents' full wood panel basement with my milk and my cookies, and I'd turn on TV, and back then there wasn't a lot of channels. <laughs> There was a lot of shows, but one of the shows was this show called The Monkees. There was this guy named Davy Jones on that show. I always wanted to be that guy. And then I started to do this kind of work, and women of a certain age would show up at my classes, and they'd be really disappointed that their work well, was not here, and I would always felt bad about that. Um, for some people of a different culture, a different age, you have no clue what I'm talking about, you don't know why I'd want to be a monkey. Um, so for you on the left-hand side is Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean. My name came back. Um, and so my entire life, I've always been, no, I'm not that Dave Jones. So I'm not that Dave Jones. Um, I am from Ottawa. I uh, live in the shadow of Ikea, literally. It's a map now. You haven't seen it. You can see it from space. Um, I went to school over at Laurier University for a sociology, psychology, and business degree. I fell in love with adult education. Uh, but I started my educational career uh, teaching kids how to swim. And actually, the, the age that I fell in love with was an age called little people, as we called them. And they were three to five year olds. And there was something about that age for me that was just so pure. It was like they just came from heaven, you know. And uh, I've been fortunate because I have one. <laughs> this is mine right here. That's my best start every day. I saw her this morning, as a matter of fact. Uh, her name is Samantha, and I started late uh, to it, and I'm so glad that I did it. Um, there's just... Well, you know what I'm doing. Um, a lot, actually, I'll tell you a story. Um, <laughs> So, Mothercraft, I got to know through Samantha, actually. I ended up going with my daughter and my wife to Mothercraft, and through that I met the Early Year Centers, and then I just was totally blown away by what had happened in the province of Ontario, since between I'd last had anything to do with young children and now. Amazing. Um, and through her, I've really seen a whole different take on what early childhood education is about, and the passion that it takes to do it every single day, for sure. Um, our objective today is definitely Passion Network, that's the idea, and I'm going to run two workshops as well for those of you that signed up for me. Um, I'll be doing one in the morning and again in the afternoon. And the objective all the way through is to help you to get this passion for work. But I know, if you're here today, that you already have passion for the work. But the thing is that it's not all roses, is it? <laughs> uh, and so this idea of sustaining Passion at Work is something that I've come to realize about when you really care about the work that you do, and who really cares about the work that they do, put your hand. Exactly. Um, that you have those days where you kind of float all day long and your feet don't even touch the ground, you know, and you, you leave and you think, wow, I can't believe they pay me to do this. Not very much, I understand, but they do pay you. A um, little bit. And, um, and then you have those other days where the kids are really cranky, the kids are sick, it's a snow day and the snowsuit thing, and the parents are having a bad day and the parents are really rushed, the parents don't come to pick them up. I mean, there's all those things that happen um, over the course of a career in this field which make those floating days really special. Um, and what I'm hoping this keynote can do for you is to give you a little bit of an insight into why it is you have those days where you float and why it is those, you have those days when you don't and what you can literally do to change things, shift things a little bit to give yourself more of the floating days, more of the days where you feel like you've got that passion while you're in the job. Because Lord knows it's not for the fabulous pay and benefits, that's for sure. Um, so, uh, your mission, you know, it's one thing to be passionate about providing integrated services to contribute to healthy child development and the harmonious beginning of their schooling. Who has some kind of a mission statement where they work, something that's on the wall that says this is what we stand for? 
Everybody, you know one of those? Those things are cool. Uh, it's one thing to be passionate about it, but as I'm saying, it's another thing to be passionate and doing it every single day. <coughs> every day. All day. So it's one thing to be passionate about what you're doing, it's another thing to just kind of keep on going with it. So why am I talking about passion anyway? Since 2001, when I first started doing the research for the book, um, I got into it because I felt that there were benefits to passion. And the more I sort of thought about it, and the more research I did, the more I realized there were some pretty significant benefits. Like when you've had one of those days where you're passionate at work, when you go home, your family's happy to see you, aren't they? Which is kind of nice, yeah. Those other days, not so much. <laughs> um, there's lots of research that emerged since I did the book to suggest that when you're highly engaged at work, your health is better. Your heart rate's better, your blood sugar levels are better. I mean, all sorts of good things happen when you're more or less passionate in your work. Um, your community benefits. I mean, here's a community right here of people who are here because you care. And whenever you get people who care about a lot about their work, and in your case, children, all the way from zero up to 12, then your community's benefiting from that passion. Uh, your clients, and I consider your children and, your, and the parents to be clients, uh, that they benefit from your commitment and engagement on a daily basis, even when things are tough at work. Uh, your colleagues benefit. Have you had the opportunity to work with a bunch of people who are passionate in their work? Put up your hand if you have. Have you had the opposite experience where people are like a little burnt out? Yeah, not so much fun. Um, so when people are passionate, it's more fun to go to work, quite frankly, and it benefits you. And then lastly, your organization, wherever you work, benefits when you've got people who are more or less passionate at work because they stay longer, they tell their friends that they want to work there, they recruit for them. There's just a lot of real great things that happen when you're highly engaged at work. So for that reason, since 2001, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out this question, and I think it's actually a pretty big question, which is, what is passion anyway? So this is the definition I came up with after all this research that I did, uh, and here it is. Passion is a strong emotion that happens within each of us when we're doing meaningful work that makes us feel better about ourselves at a pace that feels like real progress, or here's the formula to remember, meaning times progress equals passion. And I think that each of us is a manager in our own lives of meaning on the one hand, progress on the other. And if you think about it in those two ways, you can start to really dramatically influence your own passion, passion of the people who are caring for the kids you're caring for, their parents or caregivers or guardians, uh, and you can start to influence the passion of each other as well. Um, it seems simple, and it is simple, and I think that's actually the real strength of it. When I keynote, I, I ask people, you know, what words out of this stand out for you? So as you're sitting there in your seat, you're thinking, well, that word's interesting, and that word's interesting. It might be that these are the words that appear to you. So I often get people say that, you know, passion's a strong emotion. It's not, I think my job. It's, I love my job. I can't believe they paid me not enough money to do this. Um, <laughs> it's about doing meaningful work, right, for sure. It is about doing work that you really, really care about in different ways, not just what you produce, but how you produce it. There's a strong link between really enjoying your job and getting a lot out of it and how you feel about yourself. Uh, and if you've ever watched someone go through a long period of unemployment, you'll see even the most confident people, their level of confidence goes down and down and down and down and down, the more they're not engaged in work that really matters to them, and that the reverse is also true. There's just something inside us that does that. Um, my strong advice to anyone who's going to work with youth or want to work with youth is to help them to understand that that first job that they get is not a throwaway. Rather, it's a really important opportunity to find out something about yourself, about what you're capable of. You'd be better volunteering for something that's challenging and learning what you've got inside you than doing some job you can do in your sleep for more money, in my, in my opinion, because of this. And then the last piece is real progress, and that was a real insight for me, which is that it's one thing to care about your work. It's another thing to feel like you're moving in the right direction, more or less. So, meaning, progress, passion. And we're going to play around with this as we go through the keynote. So when you put it together, you get this model um, that you see here, which is uh, meaning on the one side, progress on the bottom, and action. And yes, definitely, to be passionate at work, you've got to do something. <laughs> you guys are doing lots of things, that's for sure. Sleeping on the couch doesn't quite work. Um, so let's go through the model a little bit. Let's start with meaning. I always thought to be passionate about your work, you had to care about uh, what you produced. Um, what I didn't realize was that this sense of meaning also comes from how you do the work, and actually it's both is where meaning comes from, and they're both equally important. So we're going to go through both of them. The first one is product matters. Uh, so in your case, what's your product? What are you producing? Children? Is that fair to say? Some of you are actually producing children. I saw somebody at the back back there who's producing a child very quick, very soon. Um, but what we're producing is healthy children, right? Is that fair to say? Uh, we're producing parents who are able to cope with the stress of raising a child. Uh, we're educating a community 
for how to create an environment in which children can really truly become what they're capable of becoming. Is that fair to say? Um, so by a show of hands, do you think what you do on a daily basis from that product I'm talking about point of view does this, makes the world a better place? Put up your hand if you do. Oh my god, yes, you should be putting up both hands and all your feet and your toes and everything else that you've got that you could put up because really, I can't think of anything that's much more important. Honestly, I can't. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that are important that people produce in the world, but children, parents, community, like, I don't know. To me, that's sort of the ultimate thing. That's what it's all about. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean that every day is going to be floating. But what it does mean is if you stay connected to why you're going to work every day, this part of it, then it makes it a lot easier to get through those rough times when your budget gets cut, when uh, you're sick, when the kids are sick, when the parents are griping, or whatever it might be. So my feeling about wherever you work is that there ought to be somewhere on the wall that says, we make the world a better place every single day through the eyes of the children, through the eyes of the parents. That's what I think. And the more you can see that every day and remind yourself of that, the more you realize why you're doing what you're doing. Because, like, I have a three-year-old. It's so important. It's so important. Um, process matters. So even if you got into this because of what I just said, which is likely, how you actually do the work is as important, in my opinion. Um, and so this idea of when I grow up, I want to be. Uh, you know, when you're a child and you're, you know, you're in grade five, and someone like me comes and talks to your class, and they say, "What do you want to be when you grow up, little Johnny, Susie, Estelle?" Um, what do they say? They say, "I want to be a fireman, or a policeman, or a nurse, or something like that." Right? They don't ever say, "I want to be an early childhood educator, working in a small daycare operation." <laughs> I want to be a manager working for the city of Cardwell. No, they don't say that. That's not what they say. They say all these things, and like my nephew would have said, I want to be a pumpkin farmer. That was his thing. He wanted to be a pumpkin farmer. God love him. He actually got a pumpkin patch. He grew pumpkins. He put that out of the way. He's moved on. Um, <laughs> but rarely, if ever, do they say the jobs we actually end up doing. And so much of, I think, this meaning of work comes from how we do it. So some of the things on the slide here would appeal to some of you. Like, for some of you, it's about challenge. I don't want to go to work and teach the same stuff every day. I want to do different stuff. I want to try different stuff. I want to be right on the cutting edge. Whereas for other people, it's about routine. I want to know exactly what's expected. I want to have everything just so. I want to have structure. Um, for some people, it's about training and learning new stuff. For other people, it's about teaching. For some people, it's about if I have a great leader or manager, someone I'm following, then yay. For other people, they're like, yeah, I don't want to spend a lot of time with my leader. Actually, I don't like them that much. I don't really want to hang out. <laughs> You know, for some people it's all about fun, for some people it's all about team. Gotta have a good team, we have to like each other, we have to go to the weekend, like we have to know each other, like that's really important for other people. Yeah, I'm more private, I, you know, we work together, but I don't really want to know you that much. Um, you know, some people are about rules, some about creativity, some about I want security, some are like, I don't care about security. Some people want a career track that they're going, and for everybody, we all have values that we live by. These are things like uh, respect, honesty, uh, excellence, uh, fun, play, creativity. Um, we each have values that kind of underpin who we are. And when we're working with people where the values are the same, or close enough, things are pretty good from a meeting point of view. When you're working on a team where the values of the team are different from your own values, for instance, you're all about challenge and they're all about the same, that's tough, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So what I found is that when you get a team of people working together that they know what their shared values are, they've talked about what they are enough that they know, because they're always there, we just don't talk about them, and they honor them, ta -da, you end up with more meaning. Then throw the other stuff in the mix, and then you end up with an environment that creates more meaning for you. So when you're well aligned in your group, better. When you're misaligned, not so good. And this goes to parents too. Like, do you have a value statement on the wall or wherever you work that says these values we have around here for kids and stuff? Yeah, I'd highly recommend that. Because my experience with kids is that they thrive really well knowing how they're supposed to treat each other and why, and the parents really thrive too understanding the same thing. Because what you're hoping for is that the values you're trying to create wherever you work can be emulated enough anyway back in the home. So that when they come from wherever they live to you, if there's a bit of an alignment between those two value sets, then they adjust quite easily. But when there's a real difference between the way they're living at home and the way they're living with you, that's where you get a lot of adjustment and readjustment and after the Christmas holidays and ah. So the more obvious you are about that piece, what I find is the more meaning amps up. So mission on the one hand, values on the other. 
what's meaningful to you might not be to me. Like, there aren't a lot of men in the room, and the ones who are here are incredibly lucky to work where you work. I'm totally serious. Are you kidding me? Look at all the women here. It's fabulous. So if you're a guy, man, holy God, this is like the best thing that could have ever happened to you. Honestly. But the, but, but the reality is that there's not a lot. Why is that? And I don't know why exactly, except to say I suspect they don't find it as meaningful. And money, maybe both. Maybe they find money more meaningful, quite honestly. Um, I mean, hey, I'm a man, let's be honest. Um, so this is what I think. I think meaning is one of those things that's very personal. What makes you feel meaningful isn't necessarily the same thing as somebody else. Cultures are different on this, as one example. Um, so what causes you to feel meaningful from a process or product point of view can be different, but when you feel meaning, you're well on your way to having engagement. And I think your role as, a, as, a, as an educator with children and with youth is to find out what they find meaningful. What does this child that's only three years old find meaningful? What do they like to do? Why do they like to do it? Are they a puzzler? Do you know what I mean? Are they a destructor? You know, are they an artist? Are they a singer? Are they a dancer? Like, what is it that they like to do? And then try to help them to sort of grow that strength, which they naturally have within them. That's meaning. That's exactly what that is. Uh, so that's the meaning side of the equation. The next side of the equation is progress. So um, what's the difference between action and progress? Well, action means you're running on a treadmill. <laughs> uh, progress means you're actually moving somewhere. Has anyone ever had an experience at work where you've been very, very, very busy, but you didn't feel like you were doing anything that really mattered that much? Yeah. Um, have you ever had that other experience where something happened? You know, it was one thing that happened with a kid or with a family, it was a breakthrough, and you were like, yeah, look at that progress. Anybody had that? Yay, I'm going home, I'm done. That's what it was all about. Don't call me. Um, so this thing of progress is a leap forward, or at least movement forward. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about progress. There's lots being written about the subject now since I first did my research. Uh, I'll tell you a little story to sort of help illustrate the point. I like to go hiking in the woods. Does anybody else like to hike? Any hikers here? Fantastic. Every year up until my daughter was born, I'd go to the mountains of BC or Alberta to hike. This is a picture from one of my trips. And um, I'd go with two other friends who were geologists, and they're very experienced in the bush, which is good, because I wasn't back then. And early on, we started taking uh, new people. It just became a thing. Every year, we'd bring somebody new with the shiny pack and the shiny boots and the whole thing. And we'd be in the Forest Service parking lot, ready to go on our hike, and it'd be all excited, lots of pictures being taken. Uh, and then we just start crashing through the bush because we don't use trails. And about an hour in, you start to hear that phrase you hear from your kids in the backseat. <laughs> exactly, we're almost there yet. And then we sit down for lunch, and the bugs are around, and they don't really like the lunch, and they're not really having a good time, you know? Um, and then we break through, and this is also from one of our trips, and this is the Alpine. So you break through the tree line, and that's the whole point, is to break through the tree line. And in this trip, we went up to the ridge that's on the right, we got all the way to the top, and on the way up, people's whole expression changes, and they start going, woo -hoo, we're almost there. I mean, they're still tired, it's still hard work, but it's a different vibe. Um, what do you think people do when they get to the top? <laughs> you celebrate, they rest, maybe they take some pictures. That picture on the top, yay, it's me, right? They do take that picture, but what you wouldn't know unless you've done it is they actually take pictures of small rocks off in the distance. <laughs> and when they show you their pictures from their trip, they're very excited about little teeny rocks off in the distance. And you're kind of going, what are you talking about, dude? They're small rocks, why are you so excited? And then they'll say the magic phrase, which is, you don't understand, I was there, then I was here, I was there, I was here. And this distance between the two places becomes something that's very inspiring. So, you know, when you're lost in the trees, when you're lost in the forest, it's hard to see where you're going and it's hard to see where you came from. Anybody had this experience at work of feeling like you were lost in the forest? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then that other experience is, had anybody had the Alpine experience where you felt like you were skipping through the meadow, doing all sorts of great things, and things were just going along the way you wanted them to, your expectations were being fulfilled. Anybody had that? Come on, <laughs> uh, a little bit. I think part of what progress is, is that when you're lost in the forest, um, the trees are actually markers of progress, but they don't look like that. So we had a guy that came on our trip named Mark, and Mark was a tree hugger. I didn't know they actually existed. He hugged trees. <laughs> it was very shocking at first when Mark started doing that. We were like, what are you doing, Mark? Why are you hugging the tree? That's, that's all I do. Um, then he started lying down with fungus and flowers and taking pictures and kind of like, what are you doing, man? We want to get to the outline. Let's go. What I saw through Mark after I got less frustrated was, <laughs> was that he saw the trees as progress. 
So all the little obstacles, all the little stuff that made work difficult, what he saw there, and this was true of him in general, was that he saw those things as progress. And that's how we identified it. Whereas for me, really, I was looking for this. And I think sometimes at work, what you're trying to do uh, with child development and community development is such big <laughs> stuff. <laughs> it's not like flicking on a light switch. It's so much bigger than that. Like you're talking about people's lives, their personalities, their everything that goes on in their lives. Like it's such a big thing, you know? And sometimes it's, it's easy to get in that place where you're only seeing trees. And to not sort of stop and look behind you and say, wow, look how far we've come. Look how many obstacles we've got, we got behind. The other thing I'll say about this is that you may be able to see that there's kind of a ridge right in the middle of that picture. <laughs> I'll never forget that ridge because from the bottom it looks like it's all up and it's not. Because you get to the top of that little ridge in the middle and then you have to go way down again. And I don't like to go down, I really don't. I'm very linear in my expectations for progress. I've had to learn to be more mature about that because the reality is progress is never all the way up. It's always down and up again. So those tone moments where you feel like you're really going backward with a kid or with a parent or with yourself or with a colleague or with a leader, sometimes really what that is is just a natural course of events that take you where you want to go. If you didn't go down, you could never come up. And those moments of down really are still progress if you're willing to see them for what they truly are. Um, and I think hopefully this metaphor helps you to see that. So that's progress. Really at its root, progress is actually an emotion. You either feel it or you don't. And if you're not feeling progress, there's something that's telling you you're not having progress. And if you are feeling it, there's something that's telling you that you are. I call them signals of progress. Uh, and on that vein, I want to tell you a story about uh, Heather Ross McManus, uh, who is an Olympian. Anybody know any Olympians? Tough to be an Olympian in Canada because they have no money. Much like yourselves, they have no money. Uh, and so to be an Olympian, if you really want to make it, you've got to not work in essence. So you go to your parents, they mortgage their house, you get your entire community to raise money for you. Um, and so at the end of all that, there's a fair amount of pressure to do what? What are you trying to do? As an Olympian? Right, win the gold medal, hopefully, or at least a medal. Uh, and in Heather's case, she was doing quite well. She was tracking as a trampolinist for the 2004 Olympics to qualify. And then things started to go bad, really bad, awful, 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 and her coach quit. And then Heather was feeling pretty depressed. And so she was at home for two weeks, and another coach in a very small industry phoned her and said, hey, Heather, I hear things didn't go too well, your coach quit, that's too bad. Thinking about coaching you, can I meet you? She said, yes. He came to her house, they had coffee, talked about what had happened over the last months of her training life. And then he said, um, this is going to seem weird, I know, but I, I think I want to coach you. But in order to coach you, I've got to see where you spend most of your time, and where that is is where you sleep, and that's your bedroom. We're at your house, and I want to see your bedroom. She thought that was a little weird, um, but she was pretty depressed and had nothing else going on, so she thought, what the heck? Sure, go on. Go to my bedroom, I don't care. Um, and on the wall of her bedroom was posters and inspirational things and collages because she was artistic. So the coach stood there and he looked on the walls, and then all of a sudden he started spontaneously ripping posters off the wall. And she was like, oh my god, what are you doing? Stop it, I, I collaged that. Um, and then he sat her down and he said, Here's the thing. I think you've been focusing on all the things that you can't control. So like on the day of a competition in a judge sport, can you control what the judges say? No. Can you control what an athlete you've never even met does on the day? No. Can you control when you get hurt? No. All the things that you've been worried about you can't control. So if you're going to work with me, all I want you to do is think about the following three things, and it's all we're going to work on together. And that's flips, twists, fun. Flips, twists, fun. Because that's the only thing we actually can control. The rest of it, we can't control. And if we worry about that stuff, then we're going to start to feel like we're making progress, we're making a difference. And that's what they did. She went to qualify for the 2004 Olympics, which was huge from where she was, and then came forth. She felt amazing. Now, would she have wanted to come in the medals? Yeah. But on the day, lips, twists, fun, she did what she could, she performed great, she was really proud of it. She tells the story as a message to anyone who's trying to do really big things, and I think you're trying to do really big things. There's so many things you can't control. So, so many. But what you can control is the flips, twists, and the fun. Like, you can control those interactions, those things, as much as you can from your side, and if you inject joy into the process, then you're more likely to stay connected to meaningful progress. Whenever you're trying to do big stuff, don't worry about the stuff you can't control. It'll just bum you out. That's another way of looking at it. Um, so, if that was all I'd ever learned about passion, I probably would have stopped there. Um, but once I figured out what passion was, I started to wonder, well, what isn't it? Uh, and that actually became a big part of what the whole thing was. 
So if what you got out of this so far is I'm gonna manage meeting and connect to it, I'm gonna manage progress and connect to it, excellent, fantastic. Um, but this other part I think you might find can be helpful in terms of figuring out what's your emotional health at work right now? What's it been in the past? Because once you understand where you are emotionally at work, you can actually start doing something about it. Um, pretty quickly, as a matter of fact. So this is the full passion works model. You'll see there's a bunch of words on here like obsessing and passion flowing, coasting and rushing, resting and boring, dreaming and breaking. So we're going to go through each one of these with some pace because the words are pretty self-explanatory. And you may see yourself in some of these places. You're never only in one of these places, you're in many of them. Um, and you might have days where you're more in one and less in another. So we'll see how this resonates for you. First one is griping, which is on the upper left hand side of the model. What's another word for griping? Complaining, bitching, moaning, exactly, good. Um, so has anybody ever griped at work? Do you know what I'm coming at? Anybody else griped at work that you know that's there? I love our hands go for that one. Um, so this griping idea is that as the model describes you're on the upper left hand side of the model, which means you've got lots of meaning, but not a lot of progress. That's what you're missing. So anyone who's complaining at work, whether it's a kid, a parent, uh, a guardian, you or your boss, the reason that they're complaining, I assure you of this, is because something to do with progress isn't happening the way they expect it to. That's exactly what the issue is. The issue isn't whether they care. The issue is what are they expecting for progress? And is that something that's happening? In their mind, not happening. So far so good? How to help someone in that place? Sometimes people are blocked from progress. They need to learn a knowledge, a skill, a process, a procedure, they need resources, they need time, they need something to unblock them. They need an idea. But sometimes people's expectations for progress are completely out of whack with reality. You know? So for instance, I expect the kids to be happy the whole time they're with me every day. <laughs> So, when joining this field, if that's your expectation, you may find yourself griping a little bit. Tell someone with a little bit more seniority comes over and says, you know, that whole thing about every day, that doesn't really happen. You get that, right? Um, it's kind of like toilet training to your young child. I expect them to, as soon as I mention the subject, boom, they're toilet training. No, that's not the way it's going to go. Um, so, expectations for progress are a big part of it. And then the other thing is that sometimes people who are really passionate about what they're doing are making lots of progress, but because they've never stopped to pause and look around, they're not recognizing the progress that they're making. And with children, I think this is really true, that you know, when you look back over the course of six months, you can see all this progress that's visible to you from that alpine level, but when you're right in the middle of it, you don't see it so much, and you can start to gripe about things that really, you know what, there's a lot more progress going on here than you think. So if you're caught in gripe and you know anybody that is, how do you unblock it, how do you manage expectations, and how do you honor the progress that you're actually making? And that's right. Uh, the next one is rushing. Anybody ever had a period of work where you were rushing? Felt like you were rushing? How does that feel? Really exhausting, really draining. Um, I mean, lots of women that are in rushing. And the reason they're there is because they are at work. They say yes to everything at work. They're the go-to person at work. Then when they come home, they're doing all the cooking, all the cleaning, all the child rearing, everything. They are the go-to person for everything in their life. And they are so busy, lots of action here. But because they're so spread thin, they're not making stuff move forward that they care enough about for it to feel like meaningful progress. So things feel a little empty, even though they're doing things they care about. Does this resonate for anybody in the room? Yes, I'm sure it does. Um, so your advice to someone in that place might be the following. I think you should say no to some things. That's good advice. You don't have to do everything. Say no sometimes to other people do stuff. Go along with that is delegate some stuff to other people who could do it. So if you have a 14 year old, let them cook dinner very badly. <laughs> very badly. And at the end say, that was fabulous. Thank you very much for that. Let your husband fold the laundry badly. They will do it badly, and if you correct them, it's the last time they will ever do laundry. Um, now, for some of us, that's on purpose, you understand, but still, the idea is if you're going to delegate people, you've got to let go of your standards for excellence. If you're going to let a child tie their own shoes, well, guess what? They're not going to do it like you would do it, but it's the only way they're going to learn. Or go to Velcro, of course, is the other option. Um, are you with me? Do you get what I'm saying here? So, this idea of rushing is you've got to sort of say no to some things, you've got to delegate some things, and you've got to let go of your own standards. The other thing I would say is that <clears throat> we live in a society where we literally think we can do everything, and we can't. So it does 
come down to making choices about what you want to put your, your limited energy into so that you can stay in that engaged space. Because the thing about rushing is eventually it'll burn you out. And you're not much fun when you're in rushing too, by the way. <laughs> if you didn't already know that. Um, to go along with that is obsessing. Um, does anybody work for anyone who is obsessing? Yes, I might be in the room, so I'm not going away right away. I can really help this. Who knows? Another one. Um, <laughs> so obsessing wouldn't even be on the model, except it has to be because it wouldn't be a model without that. Um, it came from interviewing people who were passionate, who said, this wasn't there originally, the whole model formed organically in that way. And they said, you need a place beyond passion. A place where you kind of, your passion's gone too far. And this is a place where you literally become all about the work. Like you think about work all the time, you're constantly planning work, you're, you're processing work, you're reflecting on work. Um, and you know, the lovely devices we carry around with us are all work related, electronically speaking. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you've sort of stopped doing all the things in your life that weren't really work. Except for the stuff you kind of have to do. And for a little bit of time, that can make you more productive, but for a long period of time, it really doesn't. So I asked people who'd been in this place, and there was lots of them, like, what are the dangers? I don't want to bum you out, but let me just tell you, there's some real dangers to staying in this place for too long. Like you become disconnected from your family, disconnected from your friends, your health starts to go bad, and all sorts of nasty stuff. And my message to you right now is, you don't need to be here. By pulling back to a just a passionate place, you'll get way more done, you'll have way more fun, and people will want to spend way more time with you. You don't need to go that far. It's not good for you or anybody else. So if that's you, and that's the message you needed to hear today, I want to spend enough time for you to understand that this is serious, and you do not need to be here. You don't. Um, I asked people, how did you get out of this place? Like, what did you do? Um, and what they told me was, the advice from people was always work less, but that never worked for them. So the only advice that seemed to make sense was, commit to something else that functions like resting. And what happens to people who are obsessing for a long time is after a period of time, they just start cutting all this stuff out. I'm talking about reading a book, I'm talking about going out with the girls, I'm talking about having a date night, I'm talking about going to your kids' sporting events, whatever it might be, and not being on your computer the whole time. I'm talking about um, whatever function, like exercise, if that's your thing. Is anyone still having sex? Is anyone? <laughs> Yay, back at the back. Oh, oh, that's the back. And it's a man, of course. Um, um, uh, so, um, for me, I find sex relaxing. I don't know about you, maybe it's the way I'm doing it, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so, uh, each of us has something that functions like resting. And I'll tell you, if you're in that place of obsessing, and you look at, when was the last time I did those things that, like, makes me feel recharged? What you'll quickly find is you're not doing them enough. And if it's sex, then have more sense. Um, so, so here's the idea. Uh, if you want to get out of obsessing, inject resting. That's the way to do it. Inject resting. And by doing that, you'll start to gain more perspective, you can let go more, um, and that's my strongest advice to you for that. Um, dreaming is a place where you're talking a good game, but you're not doing nothing about it. Uh, you may be married to that. So, you've got someone in your life who's like talking about all these great things, but nothing's really moving forward, you know? Um, and leaders in this place can really frustrate people who work for them because they're constantly talking about how great things will be, but then they don't do anything about it. And you're sitting there, and what you want to say to them is, Stop having ideas or do something about it, right? Because you're talking about stuff all the time and not doing it really making me cry. Right? Because you're setting all these expectations, but then I don't see progress, and what the heck, I'm breaking them. So, this is procrastinating. Anybody in the room a procrastinator? Is it just me? Thank you very much. We're wonderful people. Stop running us down, by the way. Procrastinators are very nice people. We get a lot done. We just need your help. We really do. And what we need is a bit of an action plan, some milestones, we need you to check in with us, we need you to hold us accountable a little bit, and if you do all that stuff, then we're going to be really productive, but if you just leave us alone, we're not going to get anything done. <laughs> Until the house is on fire and we have to. It's just the way we're wired. So, dreaming and procrastinating are very friendly with each other, they're in the same place, they're enough like each other that, that you could make that analogy. My advice if you're in dreaming is if you stay here for too long, eventually it starts to erode your sense of self. Because you keep thinking of these great things you're not doing, and because you don't do them, eventually it starts to kind of lend this idea of maybe I can't. And the great way to get out of it is to just start taking some steps, and as soon as you do, stuff will happen. Not all the stuff you expected, but something will happen. And that's where progress comes from. And then as you can see on the model, you start to get progress, 
and you all of a sudden start moving more into a passionate space. Uh, boring. Anybody bored with parts of their job? Yeah. The repetitive things that have no challenge, we've done a million times before, that while they might be meaningful, I'm not really finding it meaningful for me from a process point of view, or frankly, I don't even know why we're doing this thing from a product point of view. Um, if too much of that's in your work, eventually it steals your passion for the work. So my suggestion to you is, if you're doing stuff you're bored with, try to inject some challenge into it. Do it a different way, just for fun. Uh, get somebody else to do this thing who might find it more fun than you, if you can. And if you can't do either of those things, try to spend as little time on this stuff as you can, and devote your emotional energy to the things that really give back to you from a meaning and progress point of view. We all have parts of our job that are boring, it's just the way it is. But if it's too much, it's too much. Uh, all right, coasting, right in the middle. Uh, so coasting is doing enough, getting enough. Um, I uh, have had times in my life where I coasted at work. Like, I lost both my parents to cancer, and I can tell you for a long time after that, I was coasting big time. Because I could only do so much. Um, you know, anyone who's been sick themselves or has a newborn, like, coasting at work is kind of normal. And if you're working in a healthy work environment, people just kind of wrap themselves around you and they take care of you and fill in all the little gaps that you're not able to do. Because, you know, it's going to be your turn eventually, too. It's just the way it goes. But a career of coasting? I don't think so. I know a lot of people who are involved in a career of coasting. Um, like in manufacturing, as an example, I need this. And uh, leaders of a, of a line shop where people are working on the line will say, hey, if my guys are coasting, that's better than breaking, isn't it? And it's like, yeah, but if you go talk to the people, which I do, what you'll find out is they always say, you know, if I could not post, if I could be more passionate here, then I would, but I just can't. It's just not possible here. So I get all my passion inside work. And I understand that as a response. I just happen to think that I would want my daughter going to somewhere where everyone there wasn't coasting. Where they were jazzed about it, you know, where they really got what it, why it mattered, where they were doing some cool stuff to get progress, where they were really connected most days to why they wanted to do it. And if you're working with someone who's coasting, it might be they're in the wrong career. It might be that they're just not feeling it from the point of view of what we're trying to create. It might be that they're not bringing their own strengths to the table. And the question to ask them is, you know, what would it take for you to be more passionate around here? Because I want you to be. What do you need? This is the kind of place I want to work in. It's a stake in the ground. So that's coasting. And the last one, of course, is passion and flow. As the happy family you can see is floating right there. Uh, on the slide, that's what it's all about for me, which is trying to create meaning and progress in your work in order to give yourself a sense of more days than not passion. And if you're not experiencing passion at work, what can I do from a meaning point of view? What can I do from a progress point of view? How can I manage my own emotional health to put myself in that place more often than not? Because surely it's a better place, better way to work than the alternative. Um, we have this thing called the personal diagnostic tool, which will allow you to diagnose where you're at. So it gives you an assessment of phases, it uh, looks at all the drivers, there's over 40 drivers that go into creating meeting progress, there's advice, uh, the model's there, the theory. We sell it online for 60 bucks, I'm gonna give it to you for 10 bucks if you want it. Um, and the discount code is kids if you wanna use it. Uh, this information and this uh, presentation is gonna be online for you as well, by the way, so you can revisit it again. Uh, so I'm gonna give you that. If you wanna read my book, I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to sell anything here, I'm really trying to give you what I can from an intellectual property point of view, just so you know. Uh, this is what somebody said about my book. It's a book every person should have on their desk, not on their bookshelf. This should be a pocketbook so you can carry it around everywhere you go. One of the best responses I had to my book was a woman who works at Mothercraft in Ottawa, actually. Um, it's always gratifying to see someone who's read your book and highlighted it. <laughs> it's kind of cool. So, um, I can't give as much of a discount on this because we got to print them, we got to distribute them, so it's 1995 if you want to buy it, and the code there is communities. I use those two words because that's the theme for your conference. Um, yes? Yeah, for sure, kids. So what this does is it's like a 30-page report. It's got all the research in it. And then when you fill out the questions, 80 questions takes about 15 minutes. It'll tell you exactly which phases are functioning in your work. Then it tells you what to do about that. And then it'll tell you what's causing it and what to do about that, too. So that's, that's what it is. Um, so again, if you're interested, it also comes with a free coaching session with me, by the way. So for 10 bucks, you can spend time with me on the phone if you want. I'm not trying to stalk you. That's not what I'm doing. There we go. All right. um, okay, and there's the book. Um, so, uh, Albert Einstein has this quote, which I'm sure you've seen as educators, which is, if you do what you've always done, expect to get what you've always got. 
Uh, I think in this phrase, Albert's trying to say, you know, if you just keep doing the same thing over and over again, well, all that's going to happen is the same thing that's been happening over and over again, right? Uh, if nothing changes, nothing changes is a mantra from people who are dealing with addiction. Um, you know, I was coming from uh, Europe uh, in the shadow of 9 11 when the Twin Towers went down about two months after that. And I'm standing in LaGuardia Airport in this long line of customs line. And about halfway uh, down the road here, uh, I'm first in line, is this elderly couple dealing with the customs agent. And they're from Portugal. They're on a Portuguese flight at 3 o'clock. Uh, every Thursday at 3, this flight arrives. And uh, he's in a wheelchair. She's um, beside him. And what I'm hearing from the border guard is this phrase, because what's changed is you now have to tell them where you're staying. Um, when you show up at the border, so you have to give them an address. So what I'm hearing the border guards say is, where are you staying? Where are you staying? Where are you staying? Where are you staying? And it keeps getting louder and louder and louder, and the couple who's there don't speak English, and they're saying back and forth to each other in Portuguese, blah, 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 blah. And he just keeps yelling at them, getting more and more frustrated, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like, man, what's wrong with the Americans? You come to your country and they're welcoming you like this, like, what is the deal with this? And then I realized I'd just been teaching this in one of my courses, and I was like, oh, I'm seeing it happen right in front of me. Here's a guy who's doing the same thing over and over again for several months where he's staying in English, and it's not working. And he's getting more and more frustrated. And I thought, well, what should he have done? And I asked this question over and over again to groups of people, and people would say stuff like, he should learn Portuguese. Or he should get a translator, right? Or he should start you know, drawing pictures. And there was a lot of ideas that came out. I told the story so many times, and then one person in one of my groups said, well, that phrase, where are you staying, write down your address in Portuguese, is really simple. Why wouldn't he just have that written on the clipboard? Like, every Thursday at 3, the flight arrives. Oh, that is a really good idea. I didn't think of it. Nobody in my groups forever thought of it, and boom, this one person came up with it. The thing about what Albert's saying is true. If you just keep doing what you're doing over and over again, the same thing's likely to happen. So if everything in your life is completely marvelous and you're getting all the results you want, don't change anything. That's also what he's saying too, by the way. Not what he gets known for, but it's true. But where you're not getting the results you want, in whatever parts of your life, work or personal, you will have to change something in order to get a different result. But what that thing is, that's not always obvious. That part's actually hard. Because if it was obvious, you'd already be doing it. So once you come across something where you think, you know, I'd like to fix this thing, I want this thing to be better, whatever it is, the next question is start asking everybody you meet, what would you do? And instead of saying to them every time, well, that will never work, think about it and process it, and inside there somewhere is going to be an answer for you. Here you are at this conference for your day. You're going to go to these workshops. You're going to meet all these people. You may have come with some things that you'd like to change. And inside of these workshops, there may be some answers for you about what Albert's trying to say, a different way of doing something. Maybe there's something you can stop doing right now that if you stopped it, would help you to get what you want. Maybe there's something you can start doing that if you started doing it and learn it and try it and get better at it, you might find that that works. And maybe you're going to learn that tons of things, tons of things that you're already doing are allowing you to be successful and those are the things you should not change at all. Um, I'd like everyone to do a little experiential activity with me, and in my workshop you'll see that I'm really an experiential learner, but I'm keynoting for you. But I couldn't let you go without doing something kind of cool here, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask everybody, if you can, to just go ahead and cross your arms. Go ahead. If you look very negative, it's really good, stop that. Okay, just uncross your arms and put your hands above your head and go wiggle, wiggle, wiggle with your fingers. There you go, very much. Okay, go across your arms, but this time the other way. Whatever way you did it, the opposite of the way you just did it. How does that feel? You all look really awkward and not very happy with me. It's very strange, you to think about it. So hands back up in the air, little waggle, waggle, waggle. Thank you very much. You look good. And go ahead and just cross your, uh, go ahead and clasp your hands together. Excellent, good. Uh, look at how you did it. Fabulous. And back up and waggle, waggle, waggle again. Thank you. Go ahead and do the same thing, but now the opposite way of whatever you just did. Fingers are different, the thumbs are opposite. How does that feel? Not as weird, but it's still a little weird over there. Yeah, it is weird, okay. And now waggle, waggle, waggle. Thank you very much. And just go ahead and cross your arms one more time. Which way did you do it? The first way or the right way, as people like to call it. And the reason I think why we do that, and there are a lot of reasons, but the reason I want to focus on is habit. We're in a habit of crossing our arms in a certain way. It feels good. Your brain is hardwired, hardwired to automate every single thing that it can, and it starts in the womb with your heart. Pop out of the womb, and you start breathing. Never think about breathing or your heart beating again, assuming everything goes just fine. Recently, I got to watch my daughter learn how to walk. It's really hard. <laughs> I, I'd forgotten that. 
Um, it's very hard to learn how to walk. She was an early talker, late walker. So that was her thing. And who's broken their leg? Do you remember when you had got the cast off and then you had to learn how to walk again? It's amazing how something that becomes automated when you don't do it for a long time, you have to sort of relearn it. Your brain wants to automate everything it can. Have you ever gotten to work and not remembered how you got done? <laughs> Hopefully you're on public transit. People. <laughs> um, but, but you still get there anyway. Um, your brain wants to do cool stuff. That's what it's all about. So whatever it can automate, it'll automate. It gets you into habits. What Albert's saying about this whole idea of if you want something different, you gotta do something different is true. But what he's not saying is you'll have to fight your brain all the way along, even if it's a good thing. Which means you're gonna feel uncomfortable. So you might learn some things over the day here uh, where they're good things, but when you go to try them, your brain's going, stop it, stop it, stop it, it's uncomfortable, stop it. And what it's saying to you is, I'm uncomfortable, you're making me think, I don't like it. And so go back to what you were doing before, it doesn't matter if it's not as good, it's good enough. So here's the thing, you know, if you really want to change something that you care about, you're going to have to get uncomfortable. That's the only way you know you're learning. And I mean, really, in the field that you're in, your job, in my mind, is to make the kids, the guardians, the parents, uncomfortable. Some of the time, you know what I mean? Because if all you're doing is making them feel comfortable, they're not learning nothing. And kids, by their very nature, are much more willing to be engaged in that discomfort. Some personalities are different. So you have some kids that are totally all over that, some kids that are less. That's the personality side. Some people work through the discomfort more quickly than others do, but all of us are uncomfortable at a certain point. So try to learn something that makes you feel uncomfortable during your day, and then as you go out there, when you're uncomfortable, work through it. Because what's gonna happen is the very same thing that made it hard to change, once you work through the discomfort, is the exact same thing that will make it a new habit, and then you won't have to think about it again. That's the very cool thing about your brain. All right, my last slide is this one. And as you look at the slide, what do you notice? <laughs> yes, Dave's got good at math. Um, the, the middle one is wrong, and uh, 2 plus 4 is not equal 8, you all know that. Um, and the first time I saw this slide, I was doing a workshop in Europe, and this guy came in to do a presentation to the people I was training. He was a very senior person, so you know people really expected him to be great and all that kind of stuff. And he put up this slide, and it was the only slide that he put up. And I'm at the back, and I see it go up, and I'm like, oh my god, it's wrong! And as I'm getting up out of my chair to do I don't know what, um, he says, you know, the weird thing about this slide is that nobody ever says two are right. And I sat right down and I went, ooh, that's really cool. I'm, I'm going to use that a lot. Um, and I do. Um, there's reasons why we notice the one that's, that's different. Pattern recognition and this kind of stuff. But I think one of the reasons anyway, and the one I want to highlight, is that our education system in the Western world teaches a lot of amazing things uh, to us. Uh, and it's great in so many ways. But in one of the things that it does, I think, isn't so great. And it's this idea of 100%. So that if you get 80%, it means you got 20% wrong. That's exactly what it means. And if you had my dad, you were in the office, which was his bedroom, uh, talking about, the, let's face it, it was a little bit more like 30% uh, wrong, uh, and he wanted to talk a lot about the 30%. He didn't want to talk a lot about the 70%, wasn't really as interested in that. And it came from, I think, this thing that there is such a thing as perfection. And the interesting thing is that there isn't. It's this weird, phony thing that the educational system has made up in order to track things. But the reality of it is that if you walk out the door and you go into a forest, you will realize immediately that there is no such thing as perfection. Yet many of us live in these little weird houses where we do all these things to them to make them feel really perfect. And if that's your thing, then you like that. But I'm here to tell you that this thing about perfection can drive people nuts from a progress point of view. Because if as an educator, if with yourself or your colleagues, you're spending too much energy looking at all the things that are wrong, then you're only ever talking about the gaps in performance, which means you're not recognizing progress. So this thing of you know looking at what needs to be fixed is fine, as far as it goes. But I'd want to think that every day I spend with a kid, they leave that day I spend with them feeling pretty darn good about all the amazing things that they did, and if there is something that would help them and their family to improve within the context of all this amazing progress, then they'll be energized to try to do something about it. But if that kid leaves today thinking only about the one thing and not the two things that they did great, I didn't do my job. I, I didn't. And I'd want to think the same thing for myself, that if on the way home, driving home, what you find
find yourself thinking about is, oh, I should have done that, 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 I should have done that. I would want to say to you, forgive yourself because you're never, ever going to be perfect. That's not what it's about. What it's about is, while well, all those amazing things that happened today, those small moments for why I love this job, yay! And then, yeah, you can look at some of the things that maybe could be done better. Forgive your colleagues, forgive the kids, forgive the parents, forgive everybody, because none of us are perfect. And if you can let go of that, you're well on your way to embracing meaningful progress, which I believe is the key. I hope that if I was to walk into places where you work, that would be a wall where you'd have what our mission is and you'd have what our values are, and right beside it would be all these pictures and things that would be all this window into all the progress that the kids made. Maybe they'd have their names there and a little chart of all the amazing stuff they'd learned. Maybe it would be their little pictures that they created themselves that are on there. That I'd want to think that if I was a parent coming in there, if I was a person who wanted to work there, that I'd walk in and I'd go, wow, man, these people are doing stuff they care about and they're really making a difference. I can see it right there. Because if you can create that for yourselves, you get through those days where everyone's crying and so since don't work and all the rest of it, because that's part of the job as well. I hope you got from this uh, some tips. I hope you feel a little bit more energized. And uh, I've looked at your agenda workshops, they look great. Uh, and I'll be around all day. So if you see me and you want to talk to me or ask me any questions or anything else, please, please don't hesitate uh, to come and see me. And for those of you that will be joining me for my workshops, looking forward to it. Thanks very much. Enjoy your time. Lots of food for thought, and I don't know how people feel, but uh, what do you think? Woo!